The clothing was in shreds, but some buttons and fragments of cloth bespoke a man's gray suit. There were other bits of evidence. Shoes, metal clasps, huge buttons for round cuffs, a stick pin of a bygone pattern, a reporter's badge with the name of the old Providence Telegram, and a crumbling leather pocketbook. Blake examined the latter with care, finding within it several bills of antiquated issue, a celluloid advertising calendar for 1893, some cards with the name Edwin M. Lillibridge, and a paper covered with penciled memoranda. This paper held much of a puzzling nature, and Blake read it carefully at the dim westward window. Its disjointed text included such phrases as the following. Professor Enoch Bowen, home from Egypt, May 1844. Buys Old Free Will Church in July. His archaeological work and studies in occult well known. Dr. Drown of Fourth Baptist warns against starry wisdom in Sermon 29, December 1844. Congregation 97 by end of 45. 1846. Three disappearances. First mention of shining trapezohedron. Seven disappearances. 1848. Stories of blood sacrifice begin. Investigation 1853 comes to nothing. Stories of sounds. Father O'Malley tells of devil worship with box found in great Egyptian ruins. Says they call up something that can't exist in light. Please a little light and banished by strong light. Then it has to be summoned again. Probably got this from deathbed confession of Francis X. Feeney, who had joined Starry Wisdom in 49. These people say the shining trapezohedron shows them heaven and other worlds, and that the haunter of the dark tells them secrets in some way. Story of Oren B. Eddy, 1857. They call it up by gazing at the crystal and have a secret language of their own. Two hundred or more in Congregation 1863, exclusive of men at front. Irish boys mob church in 1869 after Patrick Regan's disappearance. Failed article in J, 14 March 72, but people don't talk about it. Six disappearances, 1876. Secret committee calls on Mayor Doyle. Action promised, February 1877. Church closes in April. Gang, Federal Hill boys, threatened doctor and vestrymen in May. 181 persons leave city before end of 77. Mention no names. Ghost stories begin around 1880. Try to ascertain truth of report that no human being has entered church since 1877. Ask Lanigan for photograph of place taken 1851. Restoring the paper to the pocketbook and placing the latter in his coat, Blake turned to look down at the skeleton in the dust. The implication of the notes were clear, and there could be no doubt but that this man had come to the deserted edifice forty-two years before, in quest of a newspaper sensation which no one else had been bold enough to attempt. Perhaps no one else had known of his plan. Who could tell? But he had never returned to his paper. Had some bravely suppressed fear risen to overcome him and bring on sudden heart failure? Blake stooped over the gleaming bones and noted their peculiar state. Some of them were badly scattered, and a few seemed oddly dissolved at the ends. Others were strangely yellowed with vague suggestions of charring. This charring extended to some of the fragments of clothing. The skull was in a very peculiar state, stained yellow and with a charred aperture in the top as if some powerful acid had eaten through the solid bone. What had happened to the skeleton during its four decades of silent entombment here, Blake could not imagine. Before he realized that he was looking at the stone again and letting its curious influence call up a nebulous pageantry in his mind, he saw processions of robed, hooded figures whose outlines were not human and looked on endless leagues of desert lined with carved, sky-reaching monoliths. 
he saw towers and walls in nighted depths under the sea, and vortices of space where wisps of black mist floated before thin shimmerings of cold purple haze. And beyond all else he glimpsed an infinite gulf of darkness, where solid and semi-solid forms were known only by their windy stirrings, and cloudy patterns of force seemed to superimpose order on chaos and hold forth the key to all the paradoxes and arcana of the worlds we know. Then all at once the spell was broken by an access of gnawing, indeterminate panic fear. Blake choked and turned away from the stone, conscious of some formless, alien presence, close to him and watching him with horrible intentness. He felt entangled with something, something which was not in the stone, but which had looked through it at him. Something which would ceaselessly follow him with a cognition that was not physical sight. Plainly, the place was getting on his nerves, as it well might in view of his gruesome find. The light was waning, too, and since he had no illuminant with him, he knew he would have to be leaving soon. It was then in the gathering twilight, and he thought he saw a faint trace of luminosity in the crazily angled stone. He had tried to look away from it, but some obscure compulsion drew his eyes back. Was there a subtle phosphorescence of radioactivity about the thing? What was it that the dead man's notes had said concerning a shining trapezohedron? What, anyway was this abandoned lair of cosmic evil. What had been done here, and what might still be lurking in the bird-shunned shadows? It seemed now as if an elusive touch of fetor had arisen somewhere close by, though its source was not apparent. Blake seized the cover of the long open box and snapped it down. It moved easily on its alien hinges, and closed completely over the unmistakably glowing stone. At the sharp click of that closing, a soft, stirring sound seemed to come from the steeple's eternal blackness overhead, beyond the trapdoor. Rats, without question, the only living things to reveal their presence in this accursed pile since he had entered it. And yet that stirring in the steeple frightened him horribly, so that he plunged almost wildly down the spiral stairs, across the ghoulish nave, into the vaulted basement, out amidst the gathering dust of the deserted square, and down through the teeming, fear-haunted alleys and avenues of Federal Hill, towards the sane central streets and the home-like brick sidewalk of the college district. During the days which followed, Blake told no one of his expedition. Instead, he read much in certain books, examined long years of newspaper files downtown, and worked feverishly at the cryptogram in that leather volume from the cobweb vestry room. The cipher, he soon saw, was no simple one, and after a long period of endeavor he felt sure that its language could not be English, Latin, Greek, French, Spanish, Italian, or German. Evidently he would have to draw upon the deepest wells of his strange erudition. Every evening the old impulse to gaze westwards returned, and he saw the black steeple as of yore amongst the bristling roofs of a distant and half-fabulous world. But now it held a fresh note of terror for him. He knew the heritage of evil lore it masked, and with the knowledge his vision ran riot in queer new ways. The birds of spring were returning, and as he watched their sunset flights he fancied they avoided the gaunt, lone spire as never before. When a flock of them approached it, he thought, they would wheel and scatter in panic confusion, and he could guess at the wild titterings which failed to reach him across the intervening miles. It was in June that Blake's diary told of his victory over the cryptogram. The text was, he found, in the dark Aklo language used by certain cults of evil antiquity, and known to him in a halting way through previous researches. 